Thank you very much. Let me start also uh, by um, thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. I'm going to be uh, taking on more from where uh, Karine left and, and discuss some recent work in our lab and published actually looking at, uh, in, in an exhaustive manner, at the number of cellular factors that, that have the potential to control HIV latency. And contrary to the, the title, actually, we'll be still focusing on CD4 T cells. So we've been interested over the, the, the years in, in two different mechanisms uh, that contribute to um, the establishment of latency in CD4 T cells. And most of the work that you will hear uh, at this meeting is actually dealing with understanding uh, latency uh, maintenance. And there's been relatively little work in trying to understand how actually latency is established. And a significant part of our effort right now is, is geared trying to understand early in infection, the infection process, how is latency established. However, today I'll still be focusing on, on maintenance mechanism and reactivation mechanism. And we've heard in, in, in a very nice introduction from Karin van Lint that uh, the HIV promoter under latency condition exists in an organized uh, state which contributes to its transcriptional silencing. And this is illustrated on this slide where a number of transcription factors recruited to the HIV promoter recruit um, uh, transcriptional repressors and in particular histone deacetylases. Um, in when HIV gets reactivated in response to uh, T cell activation, for example, there's a, a dramatic shift in the organization of the HIV promoter and in the type of, of enzymes that are recruited. And I've highlighted here one of these enzymes, P300, which has not been discussed very much in the control of latency. This is actually an enzyme that does the opposite reaction from the H to access an acetyl transferase. And it leads to the acetylation of a number of factors in the HIV promoter, including histones, and in combination with TAT to the transcriptional reactivation of the HIV promoter. So this is essentially the state of what we, we know and understand about HIV transcription and, and the reactivation from latency. And some of this, as, as Karin discussed, has been the basis for some of the therapies that are currently being uh, used in, in HIV-infected patients, mainly the H HDAC inhibitors. However, we, we and, and others in the field remain convinced that we still have a very uh, partial uh, and, and fragmentary understanding of the factors that contribute HIV latency. So the focus of my presentation today will be to really dig in deeper at the level of our understanding of, of latency maintenance. And the data I will be presenting you is, a, is an exhaustive shRNA screen uh, for cellular genes that control HIV latency. So how did we go about this? We uh, started from a, a cell line uh, which was generated uh, in collaboration with Warner Green, our colleague at the Gladstone Institute. This is a cell line that was infected with a reporter HIV that contains a green fluorescent protein. So this green fluorescent protein is expressed under the control of the HIV promoter and therefore serves as a reporter of HIV transcriptional activity. And I'm showing it to you here on the left. The cell line under basal condition uh, does not express GFP. If you activate it with CD3 and CD28 to cross-link the T cell receptor, a fraction of the cells become reactivated and turn green. Therefore, you can monitor HIV expression in this matter. And on the right panel, I'm showing you a a dose response curve to increasing amount of CD3 and CD28 showing the response of the whole population. Now this cell line uh, is, was generated using the, the so-called JLAT type of model and was recently shown in a large screen that compared uh, a variety of latency model to be one of the closest uh, and the most predictive in terms of its ability to predict what would happen in patients. So the, it responds in terms of drug response and that's very closely to uh, cells isolated from patients. And that was the reason for uh, us to focus on the cell line. Okay, so we uh, started from the cell line and uh, conducted a large shRNA screen, and this is shown here on the, on the bottom. Uh, this shRNA screen uh, consisted in the introduction of a library of shRNAs, um, and the library itself is uh, highlighted here. Uh, this 
vector is on the left. The, the only thing I want you to uh, take out of that slide is the fact that the, the vector contains M. cherry, another fluorescent protein that allows us to detect the cells that have been transduced uh, with these shRNA. Uh, the, the defining characteristic of the screen was uh, its scale. Uh, this was done in collaboration with Jonathan Weissman at UCSF, and they've pioneered the, the, the use and the, the generation of these ultra-complex shRNA library. And the particular library that we, we've used here uh, contains 25 shRNA per single gene. And given the, the fact that we targeted 18,000 genes and we had about 1,000 shRNA controls, this made us a total of about 495 different shRNA uh, that were tested. And these different shRNA were tested in duplicate and allowed us to generate a high level of statistics at the level of, of individual gene. So the experimental protocol is, sh is shown here. We start from the cell line, uh, uh, JLAT 5A8. We transduce it with the shRNA screen, and then we stimulate uh, uh, the, the cells with CD3 and CD28. And we did this at a concentration which is highlighted here. This is a concentration of CD3 and CD28, which yields about 50% reactivation of the population. And the idea for doing this is to have a bi bivalent screen in, in, in some way that would allow us to identify genes not only that induce latency, but genes that suppress latency by, by targeting a midpoint in the dose response curve. When we did this experiment, we uh, generated um, uh, a population which turned both green and red, isolated the cells that were both red and green, meaning they had been transduced by the shRNA, and isolated the whole population of cells. I'm having a, a bit of a difficulty here with this arrow, which... Okay. Uh, maybe I'll just, will not use it. I'll just point you to where to look. Uh, the bottom of the slide here shows uh, what we did with these populations. So the enriched population uh, and the total population were sub subjected to uh, 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 deep sequencing, looking for the presence of each of these shRNAs. And it allowed us to look for each shRNA, whether it was enriched, disenriched, or neutral in the two populations. And by looking at 25 different SHRA per gene, we were then able to detect, using statistical anal analysis, uh, using the Matt Whitney test, which genes were enriched for or disenriched in the latency uh, reactivation. This slide is, is, is the, the, the take-home message of, of the whole talk. This is a summary of, of, of the key uh, pathways and protein complexes that we identified in this screen. And I want to uh, point your attention to a number of key uh, uh, cellular uh, complexes that were highlighted. And I've, I've organized them in two different groups, what I call latency-promoting genes, which are generally yellow, and the coding shows the degree of significance of these, uh, these factors. At the bottom, I'm, I've highlighted the latency-suppressing uh, factors or uh, complexes, and these are uh, of a more blue color. I want to highlight first your, the, this a key factor here, PTFB, is the uh, key factor in HIV transcriptional activity. And so it is latency suppressing in that if you suppress proteins from this complex, the cells do not reactivate. And this was a nice way for us to uh, actually validate the screen because PTFB is a critical cofactor for TAT activity and therefore a, a well-established factor uh, that controls uh, latency. We found another complex on the other side of the equation, the PRC2 complex, which is shown here. Now, PRC2 uh, is a, is a so-called polycomb complex. It has been uh, identified and published by um, uh, John Karn and colleague and shown to be an inducer of latency. So the fact that we identified it here was a second uh, validation. We also identified two complexes related to uh, actin signaling, the wave 2 complex shown here and the uh, cofilin actin complexes. Uh, these two complexes are on both sides of the, uh, the equation, and the role of actin has actually been uh, uh, highlighted by uh, Sharon Lewin and colleagues in a recent paper uh, demonstrating that um, actin modification or actin signaling seems to be playing a key role in latency, and we, we highlight these complexes in our screen as well. In addition to those, I want to uh, draw your attention to a complex 
uh, called the FANG complex. This is a Fanconi anemia complex. It has not been uh, uh, previously reported to be associated with latency. Uh, at this point, we do not really understand what is the relevance of this observation, but this certainly uh, gives us a number of targets that we can further explore uh, for the future. And finally, uh, in the rest of my presentation, I want to discuss two complexes, a TGF beta, as shown here, and the mTOR complexes. Uh, which uh, 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 actually are quite interesting in terms of their potential relevance to HIV latency. Uh, starting with TOR uh, signaling, uh, some of the clinicians in, in, in the room uh, might be uh, aware and, and know about TOR and rapamycin. TOR, TOR stands for target of rapamycin. This is a critical uh, cellular complex, uh, which uh, uh, it's key protein called the mTOR protein, uh, is sensitive to nutrients, to growth factors, and to cell cellular energy, and transduces a response which induces cellular growth. So when TOR is activated, TOR is activated by these factors, nutrients, growth factor, and cellular energy, and activates cell growth both by increasing anabolic processes and decreasing catabolic processes. And TOR signaling has, has been highlighted as playing a key role in a subset, a T CD4 T cell subset differentiation. What I'm showing you here is uh, what we know today about uh, unique CD4 T cell subsets, uh, TH1, TH2, TH17, and Tregs. And the fact that many of these subsets uh, uh, differentiation uh, appears dependent on both TGF beta, a transcription factor, I just, uh, the, the cytokine I just discussed, but also the TOR proteins, and therefore suggesting that maybe uh, unique uh, CD4 subset differentiation might be associated uh, with uh, the presence of latency. So to test this possibility, we actually adopted a, a protocol in vitro that leads to um, a, a differentiation of naive T cells into uh, and Tregs, the regulatory T cells, and this is done by uh, isolating naive CD4 T cells from PBMCs, from normal donors, treating them with IL-2, CD3, and CD28, and TGF beta. And uh, this protocol yields, in our hands and, 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 and colleagues, more than 50% uh, Treg differentiation. And these cells were then infected with a, a again a reporter virus of the same type that I've discussed earlier, and. Uh, we were then able to uh, follow the state of infection. And on this slide, I'm showing you the top panel right here, highlights the, um, uh, what happens in terms of uh, TREG differentiation. To uh, assess this, we're measuring FOXP3 expression. And you can see that as we increase the TGF beta concentration, we go from 16% to 80% uh, uh, FOXP3 uh, positive T cells. If we look at the productive, infe productive infection in these cells, you can also see that productive infection does not really change. If we measure a GFP expression, it goes from 6 uh, to 6%. So TGF beta does not appear to, uh, uh, to change the, pr the rate of productive infection. However, if we sort uh, GFP negative cells, and this is shown here on the next slide, on the next panel, and look at their ability, uh, these GFP negative cells would be latent, and then unmask the latent virus by reactivating them, you can see a progressive increase in a fraction of latently infected cells. And this is shown here, going from 0.3 to 1%. If we do this experiment in a number of patients and compare the rate of productive infection versus latent infection, you can see that TGF beta treatment of these cells is associated with an increase, a progressive increase in latency, and no change in productive infection. Now, one of the conclusions you might be tempted to draw is that Treg state of a T cell is associated with latency, and I think this is only partially true in that we know that all of, almost all of the cells in this population are Tregs, but only a fraction becomes latent. So we think that TGF beta itself uh, drives a state which uh, leads to latency, but just the fact of being a Treg is not sufficient. Okay, the second aspect that I, of the uh, TOR signaling that I want to highlight to you uh, is illustrated in a somewhat uh, more complicated manner here. This is a, a full definition of TOR signaling in T cells uh, with the metabolic cues, antigen recognition, and immunologic, immunologic cues are shown at the top. And then the, the two major uh, TOR uh, kinases, mTOR, uh, or, or the mTORC1 and mTORC2. 
and all of their targets. So it's pretty complicated. The thing that I want to uh, draw your attention to that is that there are a number of inhibitors that have been uh, developed. Uh, one of them, which is actually is used in the clinic, is rapamycin, appears to be a, a, a mTORC1 uh, selective inhibitor, although there's some controversy as to whether it might be targeting some of the activities of mTORC2. However, there are other inhibitors, such as taurin and PP242, which are highlighted here in red, that uh, inhibit both a TOR protein. So our next question is uh, try to examine the potential role of TOR and latency uh, by uh, in using the, the use of these inhibitors. And to do this, we, uh, we uh, started a collaboration with uh, Bob Silicano and colleagues. Uh, this is a, a, a primary model of latency uh, using a, an HIV reporter, again, and uh, in primary uh, CD4 T cells. If these uh, latent cells are treated uh, with a CD3 or CD28, you can see uh, a progressive activation of the virus from 2 or 3% to 50% uh, of the activation state. However, if we add to this experiment uh, the two inhibitors, taurin and PP242, we can, at concentrations that actually mimic the concentrations that are used in, in patients uh, uh, or in, in, uh, that are selective for the inhibitors, you can actually uh, suppress completely the reactivation. And so this brings us to uh, an interest, interesting, intriguing possibility that we are further exploring. Uh, right now, the whole field of HIV latency has been focused on, on mechanism leading to the reactivation of latent HIV. This is a so-called uh, shock and kill. The idea here, is, as, as Karin van Lint has uh, previously discussed, is to uh, in, reinduce latent HIV under the cover of highly active antiretroviral therapy, and the hope is that uh, the latent virus will reactivate and the uh, latently infected cells will be purged. However, we think that in some cases, uh, blocking reactivation might actually be uh, an alternative approach that, that, that should be uh, considered, and this is uh, highlighted here, uh, suppression as a way uh, to deal with latency. And what I'm showing you here is uh, a latently infected cells with some degree of homeostatic proliferation and the fact that these cells can become uh, productively uh, infected uh, under the proper uh, signals. The idea would be to use uh, transcription inhib inhibitors such as P300 inhibitors, mTOR inhibitors, or CDK9 inhibitors as a way to lock in uh, the virus. Now, one of the, the things that might happen under these circumstances is that the cells has ways to actually suppress uh, uh, endogenous retroviruses, and we, we think that some of these mechanisms might be used uh, to maintain latent HIV in a, a permanently uh, uh, transcriptional inactive state. I will finish uh, uh, here by acknowledging the people in the lab who have contributed to this work, in particular uh, Shweta Hakre, a postdoc who conducted the screen, but also of, uh, Vincenzo Calvanese, uh, Leonard Chavez, and Kataro Shirakawa. And uh, our collaborators, uh, Bob Sedicano, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, Jonathan Weissman, uh, Martin Campman, Michael Basic at, uh, at UCSF, and the Krogan Lab, uh, in particular Eric Verschuren, who has helped us with some of the um, bioinformatic analysis, and finally, uh, Jonathan Chen and Warner Green at the Gladstone. Thank you. <laughs>